I say start simple. I know that there's a lot of thoughts out there and a lot of different people sending out a lot of different information, but I truly believe start simple. And by that, I mean maybe with just a few plants um, and really learn how the plants grow. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there's just a few things, you know, there's like, you just want to familiarize yourself with how plants grow, their life cycle, how you harvest them, um, just like kind of their basic needs. And then once you have that foundation, the combinations and the possibilities are infinite. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining the Get Up and Grow podcast. My name is Taylor Schauberg, your host. Today we are honored to be joined by Hilary Dahl, who is the owner of the Seattle Urban Farm Company. She is an author of two books on gardening and with her husband has built up her successful business in the Seattle area since 2008. She is also a teacher, a photographer, an entrepreneur, a master gardener, and a mother. She gives back to her community and believes sustainability is key to growing healthy gardens. She also has a lot to share with us today. So please join me as we get to know more about Hillary and the Seattle Urban Farm Company. Hi, Hillary. It's such an honor to have you on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. I'm happy to talk with you today. <laughs> yeah, thank you for making the time. I know you're uh, a busy owner of a business and you have a family and you got a lot going on. So thanks again. No problem. Happy to be here. Yeah. All right, Hillary. Well, um, I wanted to know more about Seattle Urban Farm Company. Can you can you tell us a bit about your company in, in Seattle? Yeah. Yeah. So we have been working in Seattle. I'm from Seattle, but we've, this business has, we started the business 15 years ago and we've been designing and building and maintaining edible gardens for the last 15 or 16 years. And basically the business started out as just a couple guys, my husband and his friend Brad, and they just had this wild idea to start building vegetable gardens in people's backyards. And so it was just the two of them and a couple friends just building gardens. And then we expanded and built out a whole design pro I joined them. We expanded and built out a whole design program. And then we had this big design installation program, started a farm in Redmond Woodenville for restaurants and kind of got to be really big. Um, hmm did a lot of like multifamily rooftop installations and things like that. And then we got to a point where we felt like we just needed a break. It had been a while and we were getting really big. We had a lot of employees. So then we scaled down. Mm -hmm. And actually now what we do is we pretty much only maintain vegetable gardens. So our service as business is pretty much only maintaining vegetable gardens now. So we went from, you know, designing, building, expanding that and then like paring down where we felt like the sweet spot of what we really loved, which is like mm. the actual growing of the food and helping people be successful growing food. So um, yeah, now we just have a, a small team and they're, they work year round, they're on salary and they maintain about 70 gardens still around Seattle. Wow. And those gardens range from, you know, small backyard gardens that might be, you know, 80 square feet, so a couple raised beds or something to multifamily, um, rooftop gardens and restaurant gardens and things that, you know, could be up to a thousand square feet. So really they, they work and we work, you know, still in a variety of spaces. Um, but over the years, we've just learned a lot from working in so many different spaces, you know, from backyards to farms to rooftops um, and in so many different, even just in the Seattle area, so many different little microclimates and um, so many different types of soil and just so many different, you know, spaces that um we we've just we've learned a lot and so over the years we've written some books to share those tips that we've picked up along the way with people and um and now we're creating products and they're just we started with a trellis because which is really like the impetus for the product creation line it wasn't like oh we're going to start mm -hmm. creating products it's like we want to make a better trellis and then um maybe we'll expand on that but Basically, we have, you know, been building custom trellises for people and they're awesome, but um, it's just not scalable and um, everybody needs a better 
trellis for all of their vegetable crops. It's feedback that we get all the time. And like one of the mm. number one requests we get from people is to build trellises. And we can't get to everybody. And now we don't really do any installation. So this is our sort of solution to that. Um, and also we're trying to, you know, part of our goal as a business has always been like one of our main mission statements was always to provide jobs for people in hmm. Seattle who wanted to actually have a livable, like um, a job with a livable income, you know, sort of um, <laughs> relatively in Seattle. Seattle. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, to be actually to be able to do farm work and gardening work and, and have it be sustainable. But then on top of that, <clears throat> really, you know, we truly believe that like growing food and, um, you know, tuning into your environment, your local environment a little bit more is going to just make such a big impact on how people um, just interact with the world and hopefully, you know, make a little, I have a, there's a bunny. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. um, it's a new thing. There's bunnies everywhere now in Seattle. Uh, just, yeah. To, to, sorry, to try to be a little bit more sustainable. So our a big goal with our new product line is to create things that last forever. So no more throwaway trellises and things like that. Um, but, and, you know, we're just trying to reduce the amount of waste that we create in our gardens. Right. And that even goes down to like, we're try we're like digging into even like the amendments we use and the type of potting soils we use. And I mean, that's a whole nother story, but um, right. we're really trying to like take this opportunity where we've, we've done a lot. We have learned a lot and we're trying to then like synthesize all of that into helping people be more successful and more sustainable all at the same time. I love it. Yeah. Perfect fit to be on this podcast and discuss some of this stuff. Um, yes. So you, 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 yeah, you said, you said you, um, joined the company and then it sounds like it kind of blew up after that. What kind of a background did you have <laughs> <laughs> to bring to the table and like get things going? Well, okay. So the business was, it was always like for what it was, it was always very successful. We actually, right. the business launched right in 2008 at the end of 2007, um, and it was this moment where it was like the financial crisis was just kind of kicking in right. and people were it was kind of similar to 2020 where people were like, oh, I want to learn how to grow my own food or, oh, I want to have this service because I want this vegetable garden in my backyard that I can tend to, you know, maybe they wouldn't be like a maintenance client, but they would want an installation or something. So it was this like really sweet moment. And people were also looking for something that was, would give hope. So we got a lot of press, just like, mm -hmm. it was just lucky. We just like got a lot of press at that moment. And so the business was successful from the get go. Um, so that's been great. But I came in with a background in urban planning and landscape architecture. And I was like, had these grand schemes and I started out actually doing design. And I, um, I quickly realized that even with my background in design, that, that just like, wasn't my thing and not what I, it's not what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was teach people about growing things. I think my passion really lied more in the growing than the design. And so we mm. brought on a different landscape designer who then worked with us for four and a half years or so. Um, and she did hundreds of designs over those years. And then after that, she moved on and started her own business because she moved away. Mm. Um, after that, we worked with some landscape architects ad hoc, um, which was also really, really great. And then we got to a point where you kind of almost didn't need landscape design. We were really just installing gardens. So mm -hmm. like I said, it just was like we built, 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 did huge installations and then kind of have been like tapering off mm -hmm. over the last like five or six years. So my vision was, yes, expand, do an, like make these full edible landscapes, work with more um, like larger scale, um, like restaurants and rooftops and things like that. Uh, but really, it was a vision that I had and I'm glad I had. But in the end, I didn't really want to like, I tried it and it wasn't didn't work for me. And so then we sort of pivoted. And you have a bit more control this way, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I don't know. What, what do you mean by that? I guess. Uh, I mean, well, I guess you've learned from these different architects and you kind of were like, okay, we've gotten to a point where we feel comfortable doing this on our own and let's do it mm -hmm. the way we want to do it. And then you kind of found your own path in that, in that, in that. Yeah, or? kind of. It was more just that I, <clears throat> the, 
if I'm going to be really honest, it was just that the taking the whole process from, you know, site visit to landscape design to installation to planting, it's a huge process when you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, quarter acre landscapes and they're full edible design and it's, you know, there's hardscaping and it's just, it's a lot and it's a lot of people to manage to run all of that. And I think Colin and I realized at a certain point that we were just kind of, we were just managing people and we weren't actually doing the part of the business that we loved. It was like just managing people. Cause when you get to that scale and you're doing, you know, you could have like eight people working on one installation and like, that's a lot of people to manage. Sorry, the garbage truck. Okay. <laughs> I should pause for a second. <laughs> of course. Um, so yeah, I think it m mainly was like, we had got to this place where the business was successful, but it wasn't really what we wanted to be doing. And we realized that there was a way to pivot a little bit and to do the work that we really wanted to do. Because in the end, like we're running an urban farming business to an extent, it's a labor of love, you know? And so you want to love it and it, not just be like running, you know, it, it, it kind of felt like at a certain point, like you could be doing anything, you know, right. cause you're just managing people. Does that make sense? I totally, it makes sense to me okay. as a business owner, like yes, trying to, yes. yeah, manage people. And then you kind of get lost in the mission and then maybe, you know, and some people might prefer to work with you because you're, you know, this more boutique service in a way. Mm -hmm. And yes. cause they, maybe they get more hands on with you. Is that kind of yes, correct? We're very, I guess we're very boutique. And we, um, what I love about how the business has evolved is now we do the maintenance. And so we have most of our maintenance clients, it's like warms my heart, have been with us for over 10 years. I mean, we have clients that I've seen their children grow up. I mean, it's been so great. I mean, 15 years even, like from the beginning. So that's been really great. And what our mm -hmm. maintenance service really is, is it's a full service. Our, our team comes in from you know March through November and they do everything they plant we leave the harvesting to the to the clients because that's the fun part and that's the part where they really right. get to engage but you know we come in we plant we succession plant we clear we add fertilizer we trellis we do everything um and so that's been really sweet and so people who want to garden but don't have the time or just still don't feel confident can kind of watch their own garden evolve and our team is taking care of that so that's been so great and then those our maintenance team has been around for so long that they're just so dialed in that now we do garden coaching yeah. so they can come in and you can hire them to come and just talk to you for an hour and then create a planting plan for you or they'll do it's our services are we have two kind of garden coaching services and one's more involved than the other but anyways and so right. that's really for people too who just want a lot of times with gardening what i love about gardening and also one of the things I'm always trying to get across is like, really, if you just know some really basic, especially with vegetable gardening, I guess, if you know some really basic or have some really basic skills, then you can do anything. But a lot of people just feel like, like getting over that hump and feeling comfortable, like, I don't know, familiarizing themselves with those basic skills or feeling confident, I guess I should say, right. that they have those basic skills, even if they do. It's the confidence. Um, the, yeah, so just a little boost sometimes helps get them over the edge and then they have a really successful gardening season where they may have been more timid. So that's what I, our, our, we're really in the, in, the, in the space of like just helping people grow from right. their garden and make them their gardens beautiful. Cause that's, Empowering people. That's yeah. great. Yeah, it's, it's a lot about empowering people. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It seems like such a cool business concept. I don't. Has, I, I, do I? Is, is this something that's around the U.S. and other cities and places? I feel like I maybe I don't know. Is it? Um, it it is for sure. Um, you know, maybe it's probably 15 years ago now. We had the first like urban farming summit <laughs> where mm -hmm. we got together with a few businesses and like the ones. Some of them aren't around anymore, but like one that we're still friends with and um, it's like Farmscape down in L.A. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm blanking on there's a there was Portland Farms and there was a, a few different people. It's called like a West Coast Farms. Oh, no. And Love and Carrots, like my friend Meredith, who's on D.C., they flew out to the West Coast for this like little urban farming summit. It was like in someone's backyard. There was like 
eight businesses. Um, yeah. That was probably in 2010. Um, mm -hmm. Now I think there are hundreds. Really? Every city I think has them. It's a real thing. And a lot of people are leaning into this kind of like garden coaching model where there are people who are, you know, teaching people how to become garden coaches and then they start a little business in their city. And so I don't know if there are as many like expansive businesses. I mean, I know right. Love and Carrots and Farmscape. Love and Carrots is in DC, Farmscape's in LA and San Francisco. I know they're big. They're bigger than we are. They have, they probably both manage in the hundreds, 120 gardens. Um, wow. Because I, I check in with both of those owners pretty regularly. But, um, but yeah, so I think on a variety of scales, I think that this is a service that's um, really proliferated in the last like five years and especially since the pandemic. I think it really yeah. took off then. Um, but so yes, there are other people that do what we do. Not okay. really in Seattle though, interestingly. I mean, no. there are, but not, again, not quite as, as big. Yeah, that maybe goes into my next question. Like how is setting up these edible landscapes different in a place like the Pacific Northwest? Um, what kind of yeah, seasonal well, varieties strange. can you get? And yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so again, we've sort of moved away from the whole edible landscaping model and we're really just like doing vegetable gardens. But when we did, right. I remember my very first garden I designed for Seattle and Farm Company. It was probably like a five or 6,000 square foot lot and the house was pretty small. So it was a lot of garden and our goal was to make the entire thing edible. And I, I remember just like, doing a lot of repeating <laughs> so there was like okay, lots yeah. of strawberries and lavender and huckleberries and blueberries but i mean there is quite a quite a variety of perennial um edibles and even i mean i really dug deep and i think i incorporated everything that was like humanly possible at that point um but even as the climate is changing a little bit because it is um hmm. we or at least like the the temperatures have changed a little bit here in the Pacific Northwest in the last couple of years because we are planting things earlier. Um, there are even more varieties that we're experimenting with, like um, guava and um, some interesting. I'm growing wow. a. Um, oh my god, why am I blinking on it? It's a pepper, the Japanese Sancho pepper, and just kind of like okay. fun, um, explorative <laughs> crops. But yeah, the Pacific Northwest is full of. Um, of edible natives. I mean, huckleberry, blueberry, lingonberry. Um, and then there are more obscure ones like a strawberry bush or arbutus, um, which like you could technically eat, but you know, nobody really what does. About, what about the Marionberry? Um, Marionberry. Yeah. Well, Marionberry, and I'm going to, I might misspeak here, but I believe Marionberry is actually a, a cross between like a huckleberry and a, I mean, not a huckleberry, a raspberry and a, um, a blackberry, I think it's a cultivated variety. But, okay. Uh, salmonberry, um, you know, there's just there's actually quite a few. Um, is it is it really loud? Sorry. No, I can hear you. It's part okay. of being okay. in nature. Okay. Yeah. Well, of course, it's like it's garbage day. <laughs> I didn't think about that. I'm not super close to the alley, but anyways. Um, it's all good. So yeah. Um, and then, you know, there are plums and cherries and apples. I have this espalier apples behind me. And, you know, there's tons of tons of edible um, perennials that you can incorporate into the landscape. And then just tons of natives, too, that look beautiful and, and grow really well. I mean, we find the, the crazy thing about the Pacific Northwest is that it's so rainy, you know, a lot of the year. But really, we have kind of a drought in the summer. So mm. um, for a few months out of the year, it knock on wood or what I, 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 I like the break of rain. Other people might not agree with me, but for a few months out of the year, we get kind of dry weather and it gets really dry um, because it's not like there are usually no like sporadic rain showers. So, um, so it's nice to have uh, plants that are native and established perennials around your garden because then you don't have to worry about watering them and whatnot. So, yeah. Okay. I got you. Do you mind uh, telling me about an exciting gardening project you have going on currently? I know you you said you're mainly maintaining, but is there a particular project that you that you think oh, yeah. is interesting or unique? Yeah, definitely. Yes, we have a lot of actually really really cool um, maintenance gardens, but the one that is super exciting right now because it's so mission driven is um, 
is this project out in, it's on the east side of the lake. So the Seattle area, there's a lake down the middle and on the east side, it's a town called, there's Bellevue and Kirkland and not really Seattle. Anyways, over there, there's more space yeah. and there's this big garden. It's probably, oh my God. The actual growing space is just a couple thousand square feet, but the it's in a park and um, kind of surrounded by perennials and fruit trees. Um, and anyways, it's actually um, it's called the Ferriton Spur Park and mm -hmm. all the food, it's, it's paid for um, by a local tech company and it produces so much food and all the food goes to a local food bank. Um, really? And so we try to grow, we, we check in with the food bank and the food bank generally, um, yeah, they give us feedback as to what they want, what they can use and we grow it and harvest it. We have a wash pack station at this place. I mean, it's like a full blown farm in the yeah. middle of this kind of like tech campus um, with all the amenities so that our team can, can really grow a lot of food wash it, pack it, and then send it off to this food bank. So it's really cool. We have a couple gardens that are like that. Um, we Amazon actually has a similar program, um, but really? it's really in the city and it's on rooftops. So it produces a lot of food for Fair Start, which is a local nonprofit. But this, this one on the east side is so expansive. I mean, it's just like just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of food every year um that come out of this garden and, and so that's really exciting because our team it's fun to have um kind of a mission driven project yeah. like that yeah and i'm sure the feedback's been great like fresh yeah. food locally grown yes and the the thing that's really cool about this site is that it's open to the public none of it's like maybe our only site that's really open to the public and it's big and there's tons of food and the managers that the, the property management company is like people could just wander through try a cherry tomato you know try a pepper whatever they don't care it's there for the community and so i think that that's really special that it's open to the community people can wander every time i'm there people are just there with kids and they're digging through things and just kind of exploring i mean people are respectful it's not like they're you know doing any harm but you know every now and then someone will pick off a cherry tomato or something and that's great and that's what it's there for and um in addition to then providing for the food bank but like i said there's so much food that um i think there's like 34 by 12 foot raised beds or something so if you can you have to do the math but it's big and that's and that's not including um the the perennial and like herbs and berries and things that are around the um the perimeter i think we have like 20 blueberries and yeah it's just a really cool dynamic beautiful site and it's just great to have a place where people can actually go visit we get asked all the time and like eh, i can't send you to this like rooftop that we need security clearance to get to or you know it's like it, we have all of these like very closed um, spaces and this one's really fun because people can go there um, and actually interact with the space. So that's super exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Super inspiring. Um, so, and you got a few few projects like that going on. Um, you mentioned sustainability a little bit. How important is sustainability to your projects? And like, what are some of the methods you use to integrate it into your gardens? Yeah, no, that's great. We um, we are super super focused on sustainability um, to the extent that we can. Um, or, you know, we're always trying to improve, I guess is what I should say. And first and foremost, we've always um, used drip irrigation, which is, we feel like a huge factor in um, creating just like a water friendly garden. It's just, they're so efficient. And the systems that we use last for so long um and are really easy to repair so again you're we're, we're trying to create as little garbage as possible as little waste as possible like plastic and metal and things like that in our gardens so we're trying to use high quality products that last a long time that are efficient in whatever they're meant to be doing um so drip irrigation is a big one and then using we use we try to use as much well no we only use local soil and compost mm -hmm. Um, we, our compost that we use is actually, we, we compost our gardens at the end of the year. So all like 70 gardens get three inches of compost on the top of them at the end of the year. And that is because cover cropping in the Pacific Northwest in the type of gardening that we do doesn't 
work um, because our gardens are basically full until October. And unless someone wants to like wants us to pull out all their crops in September or something to get a cover crop in, which nobody does, um, we don't really have time to then go through the full cycle. Our winters aren't cold enough for the cover crop to like fully kill. So, um, so it just doesn't work with our cycle because we start planting again March 1st. So uh, anyways, we compost our gardens. And so we use compost that's from a byproduct of the local fishing industry. Okay. And so, and then, you know, we sometimes we'll use the um, medicinal compost, but we really kind of moved away from that actually. And just have, hmm. just because we found that this, the, um, the fish waste compost is just more effective. Um, so that's, those are a couple things that we try to do. Um, we try to be really efficient in our daily, like we have people driving around the city, a couple of them. Um, but we group everything by neighborhood. So we try to be super efficient and try to limit the driving as much as possible. Like people just go home and have to go to the office. You know, it's just, we're trying to become a, be efficient in that way. And that's part of partially just like for our team's mental health. <laughs> so they're not just like stuck in traffic all the time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, with our new product line, really what we're trying to do or with our new trellises is create something that you buy once and you don't have to repeat, you know, you don't have to buy over and over again. I can't tell you how many, or just every year at the end of this season, I walk around just my neighborhood and there are just like tomato cages out free, free or broken, scattered in the trash, mm -hmm. you know, just, just like garden schmegma everywhere. People are trying to get rid of it or throw it away. Um, you know, there's poly twine and just all this stuff that it just doesn't feel like conducive to gardening um in the way that i would like to envision a world where we garden where things are compostable or reusable for you know as long as possible so we created this trellis that will last forever because it'll never rust and everything that can go that can be used with it is compostable so you just throw everything away so we're trying to get you know as much to like Kind of thread the needle between like last forever and cradle to cradle and local and efficient systems i guess those are kind of like three three um three goals that we have right now and you know we're always trying to again like i said improve and do better but those are three things that are top of mind i would say okay cool yeah um maybe this is out of left field but uh on your LinkedIn, it, it said you are a yoga teacher as well. Oh. I'm wondering. <laughs> oh my gosh, I better change that. Yes. <laughs> I, well, okay. okay. That's really funny. That's how much I go on LinkedIn. I haven't taught in probably five years. Yeah, probably since I was pregnant with my first son. Um, so I did. I have do have like somewhat extensive yoga training. I did a 500, well, two what is it 200 and then 5,500 hour or whatever this was years ago I did a lot of training and taught for about six or seven years but I mainly worked with athletes it was very focused on um, okay. working with athletes it was just like what I was interested in so yeah I didn't know if, if, the, if this how does that play into your life as a gardener if there I mean I, I practice ashtanga every other day so I'm just like interested okay. yeah yeah I wish I had more um well it actually probably plays a huge role. I <laughs> truthfully like gardening. If I am actually can be out in the garden alone, just in my space, which is rare these days. Mm. Um, it, that's like the best meditation possible for me. And then um, I've always been, I mean, a, a big part of the reason why I did went through yoga training and I have practiced yoga I just am really interested in body awareness and like being a gardener, you know, just thinking about how you use your body. And again, a, a being efficient, kind of like back to this whole efficient system, right. thing. just trying to, yeah, be smart and mindful about how we use our bodies in the garden. And, and yeah, I bet when so. you're like bending over and reaching down to pull out roots out of the ground or like building something that's, you got to be considerate of your body when you're doing all that. So absolutely yeah it's a big it's a big thing so yeah just try yeah yeah okay cool i wanted to <laughs> I touch I, on that <laughs> yeah yeah i don't have i don't have anything like really interesting to say about that because i'm kind of out of the out of the the mix well, on that but i do practice i'm actually just started trying to practice yoga every day again i'm on day four <laughs> namaste <it's> <laughs> cool yeah um 
<laughs> so oh, I know you're limited on time, so we'll get towards the end here. I just wanted to say, what can you say to the person who is at home listening and thinking of growing their own food? Maybe they're not in Seattle where they can use your service. Like, how does someone kind of get started there? I know it's kind of a really yeah. open-ended question. <laughs> no, no, no. This is what I love to think about. I, I say start simple. I know that there's a lot of thoughts out there and a lot of different people sending out a lot of different information, but I truly believe start simple. And by that, I mean, maybe with just a few plants um, and really learn how the plants grow. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there's just a few things, you know, there's like, you just want to familiarize yourself with how plants grow, their life cycle, how you harvest them. Um, just like kind of their basic needs. And then once you have that foundation, the combinations and the possibilities are infinite. But I like to just tell people to to start simple. And because I think that people tend to get overwhelmed with gardening really quickly and feel discouraged really quickly. And I, I think if you start simple and set yourself up for success. So start with a system that is... Um, you know, let's say, let's just use vegetable gardening as an example. You know, if you start with something that's set up well, so a in-ground bed or a raised bed that the soil is loose, it's going to drain, there's irrigation, um, it's been fertilized. You know, if you, when you start to cut corners on things like that, that's where people get frustrated. It's like, oh, I can't grow broccoli because it bolts every time. Well, it's probably because it's not getting watered consistently, or it's probably because the soil you put it into is just like fill from your backyard, you know, back urban yard or something. So I think like start small, start simple, be successful in that, and then expand and be, you know, get to like be more creative at that point. But I truly believe that <laughs> it sounds so lame. And I always like, why am I saying this? But I say it over and over again. If you follow the rules, <laughs> which I'm not like a rule follower necessarily, but with vegetable garden, if you start by following the rules, just to start, just to start, I don't follow the rules anymore, but just start by following the rules. You're going to learn so much that then you're going to be do be able to do whatever you want. But when you don't and you just jam things in the ground or don't actually aren't intentional about looking at your mm. plant and like, you know, communing with it, like, oh, what do you look like? Like, how are you going to grow? Um, maybe I should look at a book and see like, how are you going to grow? Oh, should I thin you? There's three broccoli here, not one. Like if, you know, just kind of like taking your time to, to well, learn the rules and familiarize yourself with how plants grow, which isn't a big lift. It's not a big commitment, especially in vegetables. It's like pretty basic not to do a shameless plug, but like our, our first book food grown, right? Like literally like we'll walk you through how to grow every plant. Um, and most every vegetable crop. Uh, and it's like 200 pages and a fun, easy read, you know, something like that. It's yeah. like, you'll be so informed that then after that, you can start to get crazy and creative and interplant or do whatever you want. But I don't know. I just, I worry because I see so many people or I, I talk to so many people that get so discouraged, but they're, they're just not informing themselves enough at, uh, you know, from the get go. And, um, and not starting simple. I think one of the biggest problems, yeah. and then I'll stop talking and I just blabber on when it comes to vegetable gardens, is we all want to grow. When you're like, when you want to grow food, I feel like you want to grow it all. And I totally get that. It's like, and you have one four by eight foot raised bed, let's say, because that's like the most standard thing that people have. Right. And people want to plant it with every single thing that they can possibly think of. And then again, like it doesn't work out because you can't plant. 15 broccolis and eight tomatoes and like six eggplant in one bed. It's just, it's just too much. Um, so I think just start simple and like whatever you do grow, if you kind of follow those rules will be super successful and super bountiful. And then you'll feel empowered to, to get more creative. So I don't know. And, Is that and no one's, no sense? one's going to get it. Yeah, totally. And no one's going to get it right the first time. Right. It's, Oh my God. No, that's the other thing. Don't be afraid to try again. You know, like if you plan something and it doesn't work the first time, it doesn't mean you can't grow it. It just means either you did something wrong or the environmental conditions were such that it wasn't the right time. Like, I mean, that happens to me all the time and I've been growing food for 
a very long time. So, you know, like a couple last year, I planted these beautiful Merlot cabbages and I kind of knew it was a long shot because it was a little late in the season. They were so beautiful. And then I cut them open and they had like totally bolted. And I was like, what's wrong with me? I know better. I know it wasn't hmm. the right time to plant them, but I did it anyways. And then they bolted. And like, you know, so even when you know you're going to make the wrong decision, but yeah. try again. I'm trying them again this fall, though, instead of this spring. <laughs> I, I was speaking with. Joe Gardner, who's been growing his whole mm -hmm. life just a couple of weeks ago. And he was saying that you kind of develop this mindset through growing over the years where you can learn patience and understanding and kind of like not, mother nature is always going to surprise you. You can never control it. So I thought that was something interesting that can apply to this conversation. No, um, absolutely. And I think that's another thing is when you learn, if you really do want to garden, it does take time and it, it's a nice way to spend your time, but getting out there and actually sitting with your plants. And this is why I always encourage people to cultivate their soil. Um, because when you do that, it just, even if it's like five minutes in your garden every day, one, you're going to learn so much. And two, you're going to see so much that you would never see um, on a variety of scales. You'll see so much, you know, in the garden, like you'll see the plants changing and growing and it's so beautiful. And you learn so much from just watching that that evolution but then also you'll you'll see like every time i'm out in my garden i'm surprised the birds i see or like the different types of insects and so it's just i don't know just even like if you're gonna do it try to commit a little bit to it like a practice like a yoga practice um and it doesn't have to be this this huge commitment but you know even like five minutes a day and i think you'll learn so much and um and be so much more successful no, I love that. <laughs> um, what is what is coming up next for Seattle Urban Farm? I know you, you're currently coming out with products. The trellis system looks awesome. Yeah. What's next for yeah. you guys? It's so next. <laughs> my my sweet Colin, my husband is like he's already. I'm like, wait, we're just getting this launched. <laughs> he's like already creating all these other new concepts but really from the get-go from the trellis we did want to expand upon the trellis um and expand it in such a way that it could support perennials in a very intentional way it can support perennials now but it's not designed to be a raspberry trellis or it's not designed to be a grape harbor and so um what we're working on right now or actually in the design process is um our system is modular and so you can set it up to different dimensions you buy one kit and then it can be set up to different dimensions and so within that we're we're going to create these kind of like add-on kits where you can swap out pieces for other pieces that would then maybe support a very specific perennial crop like berries or an espalier tree or raspberries um so that's been really fun because again it's 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 really cool that we can um that we've made this system that we can just kind of like piece in different pieces so you don't need an entire different you know entire new system you can add something on if you wanted to change you know use your trellis for something different than an annual crop um or if you're just looking for uh a system that would uh, support your perennials and would last a really long time this is a good option but we're not there yet um hopefully by this fall though actually he's like trying to get this going <laughs> so um i'm excited about it it actually the the design concepts are really clever so um so i'm excited to launch that but that's kind of next working in the you know trying to support the perennial um perennial plants because we see those as a really important element to, to any vegetable garden or any edible space yeah, totally. Well, where can people go to learn more about Seattle Urban Farm Company and uh, and find the trellis that system that you're talking about? Get get a hold of you. Find your book if you don't mind saying the name of your book again. I'm going to provide links to everything at the end of the okay. show so people can find you. Yeah, so we have two books actually. Um, the first one, Food Grown Right in Your Backyard, and that's the one that really walks you step by step through how you grow each annual vegetable crop and then basics on setting up a garden fertilizing how plants grow my favorite part of that this book i love that book i just i really do it's like has a special place in my heart because it's just so well done we wrote it after like if i do say so myself 
Colin and Brad wrote it after um, five years of working with clients. And it's really like all the questions that people had every day, year after year. Mm. And so there's this chapter called Plant Life 101. And it's just great. It just walks you through how plants grow, like kind of an overview. It's like a botany 101, but it's very, very approachable and very fun. And there's lots of jokes. And so anyways, that's a really great vegetable, um, beginning guide to vegetable gardening. And it's written technically for anybody in any region. Um, but obviously it's, you know, we're going to have like a Pacific Northwest bent to it. With that said, Colin and Brad both started farming in the Midwest. So they farmed in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Um, so they have a lot of experience out there okay. as well in the Midwest as well. Um, and then the second book is called grow more food and that sort of builds on food grown right. And basically that one doesn't walk you through like, you know, how you grow each crop. That's like, how do you improve upon your system? So you know how to grow food now, you know the basics. Now, how do you create more efficient systems? Um, how do you, you know, expand if you want to have a larger space? Um, if you want to grow specific, like say you have a wedding or some event coming up and you want to grow enough salad for everybody, you know, you can, there's all these charts so you can calculate, or if you really want to like have carrots every day for the entire year, like how you calculate, how you grow that, things like that. So, um, that just is like food grown, right? 2.0, basically like how you expand upon, um, the basics of vegetable gardening. So those books are, are really awesome. Um, I know I'm close to them, but um, I did the photography for both of them. The first one I did 12 years ago, it was like, <laughs> I was a right. baby, um, but it was very, very fun. And then I got to do Grow More Food as well a couple of years ago. Um, and then our trellises are on our website. They're called the Frayer Trellis. And um, they are an aluminum trellis with steel ground anchors. Um, they're powder coated, they'll never rust. And um, they're modular. So the idea is that can fit in as many different spaces as, we could make make sense with our engineers um and yeah there will be more products um we'll roll out more products to kind of expand on that and even expansion systems maybe an l shape or something you'll see what i mean if you look at the website okay. um and then yeah we're on instagram at seattle urban farm company and we share a lot of tips there which is really fun um i have a podcast um that i have not made new content for in about a year, maybe more than that. But uh, it's that's my like passion project. And I over the years that just like our business has evolved, it started off with me just talking. And then I brought on a very fun, very great um, local kind of beginning gardener. And we worked together kind of bouncing off ideas through the podcast. Um, and sharing our our different perspectives from kind of an expert and a beginning gardener and then i started bringing on experts from all across the world actually um to talk about different different skills and um growing different crops and, and things like that so that is my like i said my passion project and i would hope to bring that back um because i love doing it it just takes a lot of time and i have three very small children and business <laughs> things going on <laughs> so there's like time is not is non-existent um so yeah and seattleurbanfarmco.com is our website everything's just seattle urban farm co website gotcha. instagram all that good stuff so it should be is pretty easy but um yeah i hope, I hope this was yeah no well no it's been great having you on hillary the multi-talented you know master vegetable garden gardener product designer mom uh, yoga teacher, photographer, <laughs> book writer. Yes. Yeah. Photography. Yeah. But, um, that's that's but, my other passion is the photography, but no one needs that anymore because we all make videos now, which is fun too. <laughs> no, photography is crucial. Photography is crucial. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you to your husband, Colin. Um, uh, you guys are amazing. Yeah. And uh, Oh, no, thank you. You'll have to have him on sometime. He's for he's sure. Awesome. For sure. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for having me on and it was really nice to talk to you. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, we'd love to do it again. It would be fun to do it with both of us sometime if we can. We'll make it out. happen. If you guys can find the time. <laughs> All right. Bring your children and work. <laughs> well, thank you yeah. so much again and uh, until next time. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.